uh, Bill got to join us, and uh, is it Errol? Errol, yes. They joined us, as well as my mom, Jessica. If you do not know my mom, this is my mom, Jessica. And uh, she was, we, we, were, we served together in Morocco for all those years. Uh, my wife couldn't be with us tonight, but uh, she's praying for us and praying for you guys. But anyways, we had about seven of us, and um, it was really interesting. Uh, it was at Ayala Park. They had a celebration for the end of Ramadan, but the way it was all set up is it was very scattered. So you had, like, families sitting in different locations under trees and, you know, benches, chairs mostly. And uh, so we got there. We, uh, we had one brother. We had Bill stationed in one entrance into the park there with a box of uh, literature, Bibles to distribute to those that would come in and out. And then we had another brother at another location where he was offering Bibles and tracts as well. Um, we went into the park, a couple of us, and just kind of mingled with the people and started to pray and just see what God would do. And as we did that, I mean, within the first 10, 15 minutes, um, Errol sat down with one group of people, said hello to them, you know, and right away just started opening up conversation. My mom met a Moroccan lady. Uh, she started speaking to her in, in Arabic, and right away she welcomed her. And uh, me and another brother, George, uh, he was speaking to some men from Sudan, and he was speaking in their language. So they were sitting down talking, and then another couple, they were sitting down with some Egyptians. So God began to open the doors. They were friendly. They started receiving, and people started listening, and it was really neat. I was just praying. I was listening to Errol over there, and he was sharing about different things and started talking about the cross and about Jesus, and I just overheard some things. Um, well, I... I made a beeline over to a man who was dressed just like this, actually, with stripes, but it was black. And he had sunglasses on. So I thought, wow, I wonder if he's Moroccan. So I go over to him to greet him. Well, lo and behold, it was the imam of the mosque, the host of the whole event. <laughs> so I said, oh, hello. Well, he knows me, and I know him. His name is Ahmed. So you have a name to specifically take before the throne of God because we need to intercede for Ahmed. A-H-M-E-D. And uh, Ahmed is another name for Muhammad, actually, by the way. So Ahmed says hello, and he's real friendly, and we're talking a little bit. And he's, uh, he's kind of a, he doesn't like to deal with confrontation. He doesn't like to talk about, you know, he doesn't like to be confrontational with Christianity and with Islam. He doesn't. He doesn't like to step on people's toes. I could tell that right away from our first uh, meeting that we had with some other Christian brothers. And so uh, we talked very briefly, and then I, I, I left. And uh, within about 20 minutes to half an hour, um, all of a sudden he comes over to my group with Arrow as, we're, as he's sharing with these, these young people. And he was pretty angry. And he said you know what, you guys are here and you're ruining our event and you're preaching and this is not a place to be preaching. He says, I know you, Stephen. And he says, you're sneaky and you're offensive in what you're doing here today. <laughs> and uh, I was like, oh, I love you too. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, he started making a scene, you know, and people were like watching. And so he basically was just, you know, he wanted us to, to leave, you know, and uh, there was some security guards that I guess they had hired or what have you, and so they just asked us to leave, you know, and I, I, I just felt like this dominating spirit upon him, you know, that he was just, you know, everybody was listening, everybody was conversating, there were some great conversations going on, nobody was forced to be in any situation, we were all just conversating, people had welcomed us to sit down and talk, but that is the spirit of Islam, it is very dominating, it's controlling. It's a spirit of control and domination. And, um, you know, I, before we left, I, I just felt the Lord impressing upon my heart. And I said, um, are, Ahmed, are you the master of these people's souls? And I believe I said to him, are these people going to stand before you or before God on judgment day? And I just, I just felt like I, I, the Lord just impressed that upon my heart to say to him. So, you know what? God's going to do whatever he's going to do. But I you know, I pray for him. Um, 
And so George came, and we all came, and then we just kind of walked off. Well, the Lord kind of took us out there to the entrance, and then we, our group kind of went around the park to the other side. And um, we were over there, and God just began to open some other doors. And, you know, I, I wasn't with the other group because I, I, we got separated. But at one point, I said, I'm going to just kind of take a walk and, you know, just pray for the people. And as I was walking, there was actually one particular guy. There were actually, I think, a couple. But one particular man, we like to say in the mission field, a man of peace. Um, it's from the scripture where Jesus sends the disciples out, remember? And he says, if you come to a house of peace, let your peace remain there if they receive you. But if they don't and they reject you, he says, wipe off the dust from your feet and continue on. And this man, he said, you know what? I'm, I'm, he kind of was apologetic. He said, I'm sorry about the way the imam, you know, way he spoke to you, the way he treated you. And so as I was walking and praying, I walk over and lo and behold, there was he right there. And he looks over and he greets me and he says, have a seat. So I sit down and I'm talking with him. He's from Algeria. So he, Moroccan Arabic and Algerian Arabic is very similar. So I was speaking with him and there was him, there was like his wife, his cousin, his brother and brother-in-law. So I'm talking to him the whole time, but I'm talking to all these people. And many times that's how it is. You'll find like you're talking to one person, but you're actually able to share with all these people that are listening. And uh, so we just had this, this conversation turned out to like 40 minutes where I got to share with him about the blood atonement and about the path of the prophets. And he was very attentive, you know, and, and you just never know, you know, when you take a step of faith and when you go out there, you never know what God's going to do with you. You know, I would just say, be ready for anything. But be willing to take risks, you know, be willing to take risks because it, it would be so easy because to, to tell you the truth, you know, I'm human, you know, and even though I know that could happen, I was a little bit discouraged. You know, I kind of felt discouraged because conversations were going well and yet all of a sudden it was like, boom, right in your face. But it's kind of like, you know what? We had to trust the Lord and just say, God, you knew that this was gonna happen and you brought us to this place. You led us here. You know, and there are so many times you just look in the Gospels and you think, did Jesus not know that this is what, what was going to happen? Yeah, he did know. There were a lot of situations where he was in a confrontation, but he knew what was going to happen, you know. And even when he sends out his disciples, what does he say? He says, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. In other words, Jesus is knowing that you're going to go on to danger and he's sending you out. But he says, but be wise as serpents and harmless as doves, you know. And so I just think, you know what? There was no evil that we did. I did no evil as long as I'm not sinning against God, but we're preaching the gospel. We're sharing the love and truth and people got to hear the gospel. People received lots of literature, tracts. And you know what? Even the fact of all of the, the, the mosque, the people there, they got to see the way their leader behaved, the way he confronted us and what he said. So that's gonna be all in their mind. And they're going to be wondering even, what is it that's so, so bad that these people were talking about? You know, they might even question that, you know. So anyways, thank you for your prayers. Um, I know God, God did some neat things, you know, and that's just one event. I think that's just one, you know. And how many places, how many people are out there that have yet to hear the gospel, you know. So praise the Lord, praise the Lord. So let's let's go on to uh, yes. I, I wasn't sure if when women go out to a hadet, you know, layman, were we supposed to dress a certain way, like when you go to help the Muslim event? Yeah, it. I mean, it, it's it is preferable. It is preferable. I think if you're going to do any ministry with Muslims and you're intentional about it, mm -hmm. that uh, you are careful to be. You know, m modesty, you know, you know, you can, you can wear pants. Um, when I, I'll just say this in Morocco, when, uh, when the women ministered and we had teams come out there, we would encourage them to, to wear skirts, you know, and to cover their shoulders, you know, at least even if it's short sleeve, but at least cover your shoulders and wear skirts. You know, that, that's what I would say. No, that's not necessary. No. But I would say, you know, just that, you know, um, 
it's that's a that's a that's a topic in the church that's really kind of like you know it's really you know it's hard to talk about you know it's it's one of those areas that the scripture talks about and and as we are intentional in ministering we have to kind of realize that because many times the person that's talking to you is hearing you but then they're also seeing you and that can be a stumbling block for them you know so i think if i'm intentional and I'm like, okay, you know what? I want to reach these people. Okay, well, how, how am I going to do that? You know, and so, yeah, practically, I think that's always, you know, something to consider, you know. Yeah. I was going to, I mean, I was committed somewhere else. My heart, I wanted to hear this. And then I was like, well, I really didn't ask if it's a dress code or a certain way. And I wanted to make sure I was like respectful for the human rights. Yeah. And I yeah. And you know what? Um, I, 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 in this uh, syllabus here, at the end, I gave everyone my email address. And so in the future, if the, you have any questions, feel free to email me, and I'll try to answer your questions and try to help you out, okay? So I want to I wanna be available. So communicating the gospel, and we are looking today at part two of communicating the gospel. And so once again, reminding ourselves of this scripture, so important, 1 Corinthians 1.18. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And that, that, that scripture just, it's so real, you know, and you will realize that as you're sharing with people, and it doesn't even have to be Muslims, you know, as you're sharing with people, the gospel seems foolish to the world. It seems foolish. And even as I was sharing with this one Algerian man, he just, he's, he's never heard of the fact that it is by the blood that we are washed from sin, by the blood of a lamb and by the blood of God himself coming down. He's never heard of the blood atonement. And it was foolishness to him, you know? But this is such an important scripture for us to remember. But we're gonna look at, starting today, at obtaining salvation. So keep in mind, Number one, they don't believe that they are born in sin, nor born separated from God because of their sin. The Bible tells us in Isaiah 59, verses 1 through 2, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor his ear heavy that it cannot hear, but your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. And Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And so we have to remember for a Muslim wanting to obtain salvation, they believe that they are born innocent. They are not born in sin. And so we have to present the fact that the gospel starts with we are sinners. We've been born in sin. The scripture says very clearly, all have sinned. That means every man, every woman born in this earth, everyone except for the one. And that's because the one, his origin is not earthly or earthy, but rather heavenly. And that's where, you, where we show that contrast. Every person is of the earth, but God who came from above, he is of heaven. And because his origin is in God and from heaven, he is without sin. But everyone was born in sin. So that's number one. You have to keep that in mind. Next, they don't believe that God made provision for their redemption through the blood sacrifice of Christ on the cross, but that they themselves, through their good works, righteous deeds, can satisfy God and obtain salvation. In fact, their good works can erase their bad ones. So some of these things were just going over, refreshers, okay? Look at what it says in Surah Two, verse 271. If ye disclose acts of charity, even so it is well. In other words, if you do acts of charity. But if ye conceal them and make them reach those really in need, that is best for you. It will remove from you some of your stains of evil. Okay, it says it will remove of you some. Okay, so how much percentage? Is it 30%, 40%? It doesn't say. Um, and Allah is well acquainted with what you do. Okay, so it tells them there that if they do certain acts, 
it's going to remove the stains of evil. But look at what it says in Isaiah 64, 6. But we are all like an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are like filthy rags. We all fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. And John 1.29, remember John the Baptist spoke of Jesus and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. 2 Corinthians 5.21, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Okay, so there is no provision for them. There is no provision for their sins. But rather, only through their good works, they believe that some of their stains can be, can be removed. Next point, they don't believe that they can have assurance of salvation in this lifetime. The question is, would God want his children, Muslims would say his servants or believers, because when you're talking to them, they don't believe that God has children. So when you would speak to them, you would say, do you think that God would want his servants to live their entire life without any hope and joyful expectation of spending eternity in heaven with God? In other words, you're living day in and day out with no idea, no assurance that is God accepting this or not? Is it enough or not? Is it sufficient or not? You have no clue. You have no clue. And they live every day like that. But look at what Jesus says, John 5, 24. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has, not will have, but has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but is passed from death into life. And 1 John 5, 13. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. Very important, once again, but it's a stumbling block because you are telling them, the scripture says, you must believe in the name of the Son of God. That's foolishness to them. That's a stumbling block. It's offensive, guys, but this is the gospel. If it doesn't stumble them, then it ain't the gospel. Jesus said this, and I love this, this parable he gives, and then he says this at the end of the parable. He says, for whoever falls on this stone will be broken, but on whomever it falls, it will crush him to powder. If you just take that concept in your preaching of the gospel, that's heavy. You're either gonna fall on Jesus and be broken by your own sin and humbled at his feet, or he's going to fall on you and grind you to powder. Literally, it says he will grind you to powder. And so this is something, a very good scripture to share. I have shared that with many Muslims, especially John 5, 24, that I have shared with them. Do you know that I know that I have eternal life? They're like, how can you know? Because Jesus told me. It's not because of anything I've done, but do you believe that God lies? They'll say, no. Well, God told me this. The Bible says this. Jesus declared this. Is Jesus a liar? No. See, we have to once again speak with authority. Speak with authority. Jesus Christ declares this. Now, you can believe it or not, but Jesus Christ says right here, most assuredly, I say to you, and we will not come into to judgment, but have passed from death into life. Next, we have to remember that for a Muslim, they believe in a heaven and a hell. Now, of course, there are differences there, but nonetheless, they believe that there is a judgment and they believe that there is a heaven and there is a hell. They believe on judgment day, everyone will be judged by scales, the good deeds versus the bad deeds. In other words, they will gain entrance to heaven by their own efforts, by what they themselves did on earth. It is a reward earned, not a free gift that is unearned or undeserved. The Quran says this in Surah 23, verses 101 through 104. Then when the trumpet is blown, there will be no more relationships between them that day, nor will one ask after another. 
Then those whose balance of good deeds is heavy, they will attain salvation. But those whose balance is light will be those who have lost their souls. In hell will they abide. The fire will burn their faces and they will therein grin with their lips displaced. But the Bible says this in Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. See, we have deserved death. We have done everything to rightfully deserve God's judgment. There is nobody on earth that doesn't deserve God's judgment. We all deserve the wrath of God. And the Muslim needs to hear that. They need to know that I, not only you, but I too, all men deserve God's judgment and wrath. But God has offered us a free gift. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, we're familiar with this. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. In Titus 3, verses 4 through 5, But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. You see, once again in the Quran, it declares of Allah that he loves the believers. His love is toward the righteous, towards the righteous Muslims. But look at what the scripture says. But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man, meaning mankind, God's love and kindness... That's really beautiful because we talk a lot about God's love, but there is like another facet of his love where it says his kindness toward us appeared. The Muslim people are God conscious. They sincerely want to please God by doing what has been taught to them in the Quran. See, that's, that's an important thing for us to remember. When you're talking to a Muslim person, in their mind, they truly want to please God. I mean, those that are really following, you know, their religion. They are truly wanting to. But the Bible says the God of this age has blinded them. And that's why they're perishing, because they've been deceived and they are blinded. But they, in their hearts, they truly want to follow the God that they have been revealed. For a Muslim to obtain salvation, he must... Remember these things. Believe the articles and the pillars of faith that we went over. Say the confession of faith. Try to practice the five pillars of faith as faithfully as possible. They must do as many good works as possible and repent when he has sinned. And all along in his heart, he says, God willing, my life is acceptable to God and God willing, he receives me into paradise. All along, he's saying, God willing, he will accept me. Jews and Muslims, both Jews and Muslims, both seek to please God in the flesh. Remember the scripture that we read before in Romans chapter 10. Through doing rather than receiving, by attempting tirelessly to reach up to God. That's what they're doing. They're trying to reach up to God. But rather than him reaching down to us. They have not understood that. And here are the th three different illustrations that I have, I have given to you. I've shared with you before, but let's go over them. The first one, the people fallen into a pit. Remember that everyone has sinned and is incapable to save himself. Salvation can only come from him who is not fallen. And so there's that picture of mankind fallen into this pit of judgment and despair. But only the man, only the one who has not fallen into sin, can save us. A sinner cannot save a sinner. And a sinner cannot propitiate for a sinner. It had to be God-made man who propitiated for our sins, who satisfied God's wrath. Another illustration here that's very effective is talking about halal versus non-halal meat. A Muslim is forbidden to eat pork, which is non-halal meat. If a Muslim was offered three plates of meat, but each one had a different amount of pork mixed with the beef, it would be forbidden to eat, no matter how little 
amount of pork was in it. In the same manner, God cannot allow any amount of sin into his holy presence, lest it defile heaven and compromise his holiness. See, once again, the Muslim has to understand the seriousness of sin, that sin must be judged. And no matter how much sin is in an individual, they cannot be allowed into heaven. God will not permit anyone to enter into heaven except for being perfect. And there's nobody perfect. Here's another illustration, a murderer in court before the judge. If a murderer is charged with several counts of first-degree murder and is condemned by the judge to the death penalty, do you think the criminal would be acquitted of his crime if he showed remorse simply and begged forgiveness? You know, that person has committed crime, has, has murdered, but if he simply says, you know what, please forgive me, I'm so sorry, I'll never do it again. Do you think the judge will say, okay, I forgive you and let him go? Absolutely not. What if he promised to do lots of good deeds in order to outweigh the bad ones? You know, if that murderer said, you know what, I promise to do all of these things, I'll do this and I'll do that, will that kind of remove the stain of my guilt and remove the stain of my, of my crime? No, absolutely not. Would that be sufficient to clear him of the charges and acquit him? What about the law of the land? There is a law that that crime must be punished, okay? Being a just judge, what about the victim's families, the offended party? In the same manner, no amount of good works can justify you and save you from the penalty of your sin. The holy law of Almighty God must be upheld and not broken. The penalty must be paid in full. God desires to forgive and justify the sinner. So these are some illustrations that can help you to share with a Muslim. Next, I'd like to look at our relationship with God and the powerful Christian witness. This is, is very important as we're moving into communicating the gospel, okay? First of all, the Christian is a little Christ, a new creation, and bears the fruit of a spirit-filled life. Okay, I think we, we, we can forget this. Christians can forget what is the name that I bear as a Christian. Now remember in the book of Acts, the name Christian was actually a term of mockery. We forget that. It was given to them mocking them saying, look at you guys are like little Christs. Okay, because the people in the book of Acts, the, uh, the disciples were living just like Jesus. And what an amazing thing that the world would actually, if you would think of it in this sense, if they would mock us and see me as a little Christ to God, would that be so? That would be awesome. You know, we want the world to see little us as little Jesuses. And this is what we need to understand. And so the greatest threat to the church isn't like so many may believe the religion of Islam or followers, or radical Muslims. Neither is the greatest threat humanism, which has permeated our modern Western society. It isn't Mormonism, liberalism, or any other ism. The greatest threat to the church of today, I believe, is nominal, lukewarm, professing Christians. This is a huge problem. This is the person who follows a formality and has a form of godliness, but denies its power. This is from the scripture. This is the person who goes to church, maybe even serves in a ministry at church, but during the week doesn't open his Bible. This person has no evidence of a Christ follower and has no conviction of sin, no hunger for God, and no burden for lost souls. He has no desire to share the gospel or speak for righteousness sake lest he offend people and be hated. There is no commitment to complete obedience to God's word and a life of holy living. I believe, guys, that this needs to be addressed. We need to understand. It's, it's so easy for me to just look at all these exterior things, and yet 
the whole, when you really read the whole of scripture, and this has been my experience, I'm reading through all the prophets now, and you just hear time and time again, God is rebuking. His real issue is with his people. His real issue is with his people. Because, yeah, they don't have it all together out there. They're in darkness. They're perishing. But if my own people are sick and self-centered and, and, and seeking after other gods, that's a huge problem. And God deals, he, he speaks very seriously about that. So look at this. In Revelation 3, verses 14 through 17. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing. And do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. And so, in this scripture, Jesus is saying this. He's saying, it is so easy for me to see myself in a certain light. But the true question is not how I see myself or how you see me, but how does God see me? Because God says, you say you are rich and wealthy and have need of nothing, but I see this. And that's, that's where we as Christians, as individual Christians, need to say, God, I come before your throne, and God, I want you to show me who I am. Reveal it to me. Because if there is sin in my life, then God, I don't want it. I want to I leave it now, today, not tomorrow, not next week. Right now, I want to repent of it. Because if you are holy, then you are a, you are a weapon in the hands of God. And, and believe me, God wants a church that is on fire for him. 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5, Paul says, Examine yourselves as to whether you're in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless, indeed, you are disqualified. We need to do that. We would do well if we constantly would really test myself, you know? And, and I, I, do that, I do that in my own personal time, and I do that with my spouse. You know, those who are closest to you, if you are not married, you can do it with your, somebody who's close to you. How do you see me? Do you see me growing in Christ? Do you see me holier than a year ago? Because I told my wife this one day, I thought, this is kind of a, probably a, uh, what is the word? Uh, not foundational. Uh, elementary. This is, sounds like an elementary question, but shouldn't I, as a Christian, be getting holier rather than more unholy? Right? And yet, like, how many of us actually think that way? And like if I were to ask my wife or my, those closest to me and ask them that question, do you see me more holy than a year ago? That's a heavy question. And yet, if not, then I need to do some serious searching of the soul and serious changing in my life. But those are the, those are the, the sensitive questions that we need to ask ourselves if we're going to get down to the nitty-gritty. Matthew 7, verses 17 through 20. Even so, Jesus says, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. This right here, you really don't have to go anywhere. This right here should explain the Christian. In other words, if I am not bearing good fruit, Jesus, he doesn't beat around the bush. He says it will be cut down and thrown into the fire. 
And if you are a good tree, then you cannot bear bad fruit. That's pretty heavy. You can't. So if there's bad fruit, there's, there's something, there's an inconsistency in, in the nature. And Jesus is talking about this. By their fruits, you will know them. And in the same way, guys, guess what? That's why when I look at Islam and I look at the fruits of Islam and I look at Muhammad and I see the fruit of his life, you see an unholy life. But when I look at Jesus, I see a holy life. I see a sacred life. And I'm not talking about, you know, a halo or light around him. No, we look at his character. We look at his behavior. We look at his treatment of his friends, of his enemies, of people. And, and we see the fruit in his life. And it's the same thing. So just as we're looking at a Muslim, guess what? The Muslim is looking at me. And they're saying, let me see what kind of fruit is in your life. And so uh, here's a good test. If you were charged with the crime of being a Christian by those who know you the best, would there be enough evidence to charge you? Or would there be a lack of evidence? Good question to ask ourselves. 2 Timothy 3, 10 through 12, but you have carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance, and then he says, persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured. And out of them all, the Lord delivered me. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. This is a guarantee. And Paul was saying to, the, to Timothy, he said, you have carefully followed in all these areas and even you followed my persecutions. Just as I was persecuted, so were you. And, and we, need to, we, need, we need to do that. We need to, have, we need to go through these things and say, God, may I follow really Jesus, and, let me, and I want to follow Paul too. Because if, if Paul is on the way of Christ on the path, I'm going to follow him too. And all these things I need to see in my life. Philippians 2.12 Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And take note, it says work out your salvation, not work for your salvation. I am saved by the blood of Jesus. I am a sinner who is saved and I am regenerated. I am a new creation and I'm going to heaven. But now what? Because guess what? That day at the park, you know what the Muslim man told me? He told me this. He said, so then what you're saying, Stephen, is that your sins are washed away and you're, go you're guaranteed heaven and so you can live however you wish. And they, they say that many times. Automatically, that's immediately how they think. But we have to explain to them no. I, I don't live all the way I want to because now I am a new creation. It's like this tree that is dead. The tree has been pulled out, ripped out, and now there's a brand new tree. I am a new creation. I am a new creation. I am not the old man. And so that needs to be understood. But a Muslim doesn't understand that. But as a Christian, we are new in Christ. And so the old has passed away and everything has become new. I gave you a couple quotes here. Look at what some of these saints said. Susanna Wesley, who was the mother of John and Charles Wesley. There are two things to do with the gospel. Believe it and behave it. I love that. Believe it and behave it. Leonard Ravenhill said, The world is not waiting for a new definition of Christianity. It is waiting for a new demonstration of Christianity. So true. So true. You know, when, when you talk to a Muslim, once again, they've heard of Roman Catholic, Catholics, they've heard of Methodists, Presbyterian, you know, they know all these things. They're like, you know, and in a, in a sense, they're like, man, what are you going to tell me? But if you are a Christian that loves them, tells them the truth, and lives a life before them, that is powerful because they've heard it all. Many of them have seen a lot of definitions of Christianity. 
and we're trying to define it and redefine it and change it around and look different. They go to different churches, and there's, you know, they can find all sorts of different, it's just all, but to see the power of it, where is the power? The power is in you, Christ in you, the hope of glory. And they need to see that demonstration of Christ in your life. Listen to what Tozer says. Oh, I love this. What I am anxious to see in Christian believers is a beautiful paradox. I want to see in them the joy of finding God while at the same time they are blessedly pursuing him. I want to see in them the great joy of having God yet always wanting him. He says, religion today is not transforming the people. It is being transformed by the people. It is not raising the moral level of society. It is descending to society's own level and congratulating itself that it has scored a victory because society is smiling, accepting its surrender. And so let all these things just sink into our hearts and just say, Lord, make me a holy vessel, God. Let there be a beautiful paradox in me that I have found Christ and I am totally satisfied, totally satisfied, and yet I am not because I want more. I want more. And you know what? That Christian needs to clash and come in contact with a Muslim because they're a lost soul in darkness, but you're in the light and you're gonna bring them to the light, God willing. Next, this is an important point. God dwells in his people, not in a holy sight. Let's look at these verses here. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Let me first of all read these points here. Muslims do not believe that God literally comes himself and indwells his people, thus transforming the person. Allah is transcendent and separate from his servants. There is no intimacy. Okay, there is, for them, they are the servant, they are the bond slave, and Allah is transcendent, he's far and he is completely separate from his creation. But the Bible tells us this in 1 Corinthians 3, 16 through 17. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. And turn with me to chapter 6, chapter 6, verses 19 through 20. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So for Muslims, God does not dwell inside of them. But God dwells inside of you. The God of the universe, the God who dwells outside of time and space, dwells inside of every single Christian. Now, th I mean, think of the, the ramifications. Think of the consequences of that. The God who is omnipotent, who is all just, all gracious, all loving, all powerful, who there is no limits, he's boundless, he's limitless, he's living inside of you. But for the Muslims, he is not. Their God is not. Look at the second point here. Muslims believe in physical holy sites and places. When they pray, they need to physically cleanse themselves. As I said to you, 
Every time they pray, they need to wash with water. Okay, there's a particular washing around their ears, their nose, their arms, their feet. They need a prayer rug or some clean object to pray on. They have holy sites around the world, especially the Kaaba in Mecca, which is that black box if you go on the internet and look it up, which are sacred, bringing blessing and cleansing of their sins when the pilgrimage is finished. And so they have all these places around the world which are holy sites for them. But for the Christian, we have no holy site because you are the holy site. You are the temple of the living God. He is living inside of you. And so you can share with a Muslim that God lives inside of you. You don't go to any place and you don't have any particular position to face the west or the east or the north or the south because God is everywhere and God is living inside of you. So that is very important in sharing with a Muslim. And that I, 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 I want you to know it is very powerful. And I want, to, want you to keep in mind, not everything you will see the effects when, when you share with a Muslim, you may not see the effects right away. But everything you share with them and everything they see in you is being planted in their hearts. It's being planted in their minds. And they're watching you. Next, reading the Bible and prayer to God can be in any language. This is an, an, an issue. Let's look at Romans chapter 10. Romans 10, verses 12 through 14. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Notice, God says there is no distinction. He doesn't make any difference between the Jews and the Greeks. Okay, between the Jews and those who are non-Jewish, the Greek world. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. In other words, what that tells me is whoever calls on the name of the Lord, the condition, what is the condition of salvation? It's not calling in Hebrew or calling in Spanish or calling in whatever language. He says calling on the name of the Lord. So any person, anywhere, if he believes and calls on the name of the Lord, shall be saved. But look at what he says going on in verse 14. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? This is where Paul brings home the, the, the message of missions. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe... In him of whom they have not heard. So in order for someone to call, right, they have to believe. And in order for someone to believe in Jesus, they have to hear. They have to hear something. They have to hear a message. But then he says, and how shall they hear without a preacher? How shall they hear without a preacher? That is the great dilemma of the world. How are those people over there going to hear without a preacher? Well, that's you and me. You're the preachers. We're the preachers because you have been called to preach, to speak, to declare, to tell the message. And then in verse 15, he says, how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. You and I have a gospel of peace and yet at the same time, it is a gospel that divides. Because Jesus at the same time, remember he said, I came to bring a sword to divide a household, right? And yet the gospel will bring peace with God. In 1 Timothy, turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. 
He desires all men. No, nobody is excluded. He desires all men to be saved. Now, although the Bible was written in Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek, God's purpose was that the whole world would receive the message of the gospel so that all men might believe and bring God the glory he deserves. The heart of God through the word of God can only be transmitted and communicated through a spoken language. See, the only way that a person, let's say here, this person speaks whatever language it is, and how am I going to get the gospel from here to there? There has to be a language understood by the hearer, by the person. Therefore, God doesn't require everyone to learn Hebrew and Greek if they are going to know God. How difficult would that be if God said, in order for you to come to salvation, you have to learn the original language and you have to know it well. Okay, we would all have to be, then it would have to be emphasized to me that I have to learn Hebrew and Greek to know God. Therefore, God doesn't require that. The language isn't sacred. The language isn't sacred. The God of the Bible and his message is sacred. See, this is where the Muslims have it turned around. The fact is 85% of all Muslims in the world cannot even read the Quran in their own native language, which is not classical Arabic. The Quran, as revealed to Muhammad, was revealed in classical Arabic, in the Arabic of the Quran, which 85% of the world does not, that's not their own language. So when a person, like when I was in Morocco, when I was, when the kids go to school, they speak Berber, which is a, 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 a dialect, okay, a tribal dialect. Well, they speak that at home with their parents, but when they go to school, they have to learn Arabic. They have to learn the classical Arabic in order to read and write. And then the Arabic of the Quran is even more difficult. And a lot of Muslims, they cannot even explain the Quran because they say it is too difficult. And in fact, they say this is one of the proofs that the Quran is from God because it's so high and it's so un -under it's not understandable. And so that's how God wants to reach us. You know, it doesn't make sense. Okay? And yet we need to explain to them and share with them God wants to reveal. He's the God who wants to make himself known to you. And so the way that God wants to make himself known, he comes in our language. Okay? Now, if prayer is one of, if not the most, intimate interactions that a human being can have with God Almighty, then would it make sense that God would require you to pray to him in a language that is foreign to you? It would seem that God discriminates and shows favor to Arab speakers versus non-Arab speakers. God is concerned with the heart, not the words. God is not focusing on like, what kind of words are you using here? But God is concerned with your heart and your heart will be expressed through your words. God is concerned with our position spiritually, not our position physically. See, for a Muslim, they have to say certain words, okay? They always, when they pray five times a day, they will always say the first, they say the Fatiha, which is the surah in the Quran, called the Fatiha, which is a whole paragraph of words, and they need to repeat that over and over and over. But it has to be said, their prayer in Arabic, okay? Their salat prayer has to be five times in Arabic. So you have a, a, a Russian Muslim, a Chinese Muslim, a Spanish Muslim. All around the world, they have to pray five times a day in Arabic. Otherwise, it will not be accepted by God. But this is the question. How can you pray in a language that is not even your own language? Where is the intimacy? There is no intimacy. And with God is more concerned with our position spiritually rather than our position physically. They have to do a certain, certain positions physically when they pray. They have to stand. They have to bow. They have to kneel. They have to do all of those things. And I've had good conversations with Muslims, and they ask me, do you bow? 
do you kneel? And I share with them, yes. Sometimes I stand. Sometimes I lift my hands. Sometimes I'm flat on the floor on my face. Sometimes I don't even speak a word, but I just meditate in silence upon God. But you know what? Muslims don't, they don't, they don't hear that from Christians. They don't know Christians like that. But you have to be someone that can share with a Muslim that we do pray because they don't know that. The way the Muslim world looks at the Christian world is that there is just everything they see in America and everything they see on TV, that's Christian. These are Christians. But they don't know Jesus. They don't know Jesus. Okay, the next thing, as I uh, shared a bit about prayer, prayer is an intimate and thoughtful dialogue not a formality and repetitious words. Matthew 6, let's turn there real quick. Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 through 7. Jesus said, And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. Now, once again, you may, not, you may not see this so much here, but in the Middle East and in living in a Muslim country, you do see that. Because as I said, they will close shops when it's time to pray, and they go out, all the people together, in front of their shop, sometimes by themselves, and they are praying publicly. You know, so automatically people see them, and they think, wow, these people are holy. This man is a praying man. And in fact, I don't know if I told you, but many of them will have a mark. It looks like a bruise on the center of the forehead. So now notice it. If you ever look at Muslims or if you ever see them on TV and if you see like a bruise, that is because they pray a lot and they bow their head and they're constantly touching the ground to the point year after year after year that it causes almost like a callus on their forehead, you know? And it's so interesting because you see that in scripture where it talks about exterior things to show, you know, where he talks about having the tassels and, you know, where they, they have their phylacteries long in order so people will know that they're holy and they pray. But this is exactly what, what you have in the, in the Muslim world. Verse six, but you, when you pray, go into your room and when you have shut your door, pray to your father who is in the secret place and your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do. So they may ask you, what do you pray? And you can share with them, tell them what you pray. You know, some, I don't pray always the same thing. I don't even know what I pray. But you can share with them what, what is it that you pray about? What are the things that you engage in prayer? And I, I, I've shared with the Muslims. Sometimes I, my prayer is adoration. Sometimes it's confession. Sometimes it's thanksgiving. Sometimes it's petition. Sometimes it's intercession. You know, and they have no clue what you're, like, you know, a lot of these things they have no clue about. But once again, it's because nobody engages the Muslims. So for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them. For your father knows the things you have need of before you ask him. So under prayer here, Christian prayer is one of the deepest forms of communion with God that anyone can experience Jesus taught us to not emphasize on the amount of words we use in prayer or using vain repetitions like a formula that we use in order to sway God to do something. Rather, it is a dialogue where we adore him, thank him, confess sins, make petition, intercede for people, and we listen for God to speak to us in our hearts. And I encourage you, if you have a discussion with a Muslim, Share with them about your own prayer life. I have the, the, the close friends of mine that I have had close contact with, I've shared with them that there is a dialogue in prayer. God has spoken to my heart. How many times did I tell them, God told me to come to Morocco? Do you know that I'm here because God told me to? Do you know that I prayed about my wife and God answered exactly? the woman that I married. Everything I asked for, God gave me in, in her. I mean, and they're like blown away. 
And then you can ask them, what about you? Has God answered your prayer? How has he answered your prayer? I want to know. You know, so they need to see that you have a living, a living relationship with God. See, that's what they need to know because they don't know that. They don't have that. But God speaks to us. Now, obviously, we need to explain that this is his revelation here. This is his objective revelation. But God does individually. He he can speak to our hearts and he can lead us. For Muslims, they pray five times daily and repeat certain words over and over again ritualistically, as I shared. Next, Christian martyrs, past and present, give a powerful testimony to Christ. Okay, we have some scriptures here. Look at this in Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, the hall, the chapter of faith. And yet, we can so easily gloss over the very end of the chapter, which talks about another group of people, not those that necessarily were victorious, quote unquote, or that conquered or did some great thing. But check it out. Hebrews 11, beginning with verse 35. Women received their dead raised to life again. Great. But then it says, others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trial of mockings and scourgings, yes, and of chains and imprisonment. Now remember, these are people of faith. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. And all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. God having provided something better for us that they should not be made perfect apart from us. And so remember that as Muslims, they don't believe that their prophets suffer. Okay? They don't believe that their prophets, that's why they don't believe that Jesus, they have a hard time believing that Jesus Christ would suffer on the cross. Because no, God will not allow his prophet to suffer. But look at what the Bible says. These people of faith were mocked, they were chained, stoned, slain, sawn in two, and yet they were men and women of faith. And so look at my point here. The the multitudes of Christians who have laid their lives down, being mocked, plundered, beaten, imprisoned, scourged, abused, raped, tortured, wounded, mutilated, and more, those which have willfully and joyfully accepted this rather than deny the name of Christ is a powerful and mighty evidence that Christ is not only worth living for, but worth dying for. You know, when the subject has come up, we can talk about that. And you can talk to them about all 12 disciples. If Jesus did not die on the cross and Jesus did not rise again, if it was not Jesus, as you say, it was not Jesus, you explain to me how these 12 men Okay, so out of the 12 apostles, we know that John didn't. John the, John the apostle, he was actually uh, banished to the island of Patmos. But 11 of them died severe, torturous deaths. So how is it that these 11 died for a lie? Okay, and you can talk about all the multitudes. I've shared with Muslims about the Roman Colosseums. Do you know that families... Men, women, and children went into Colosseums, and as they were there being let unleash the, the beasts and the tigers and the bears, tearing them apart, they would lift up their hands and they would worship God because they knew that Jesus was the truth. How in the world could people do this? And ask them about themselves. Tell me about your Islamic history. Where does that happen? doesn't exist. The opposite is true. 
we can talk about ISIS. We can talk about them and we can talk about how women are being tortured and raped. And why aren't they, why aren't they creating armies to destroy ISIS? They're actually praying for your souls. There are actually churches that are, that are praying and interceding for your salvation. But people are suffering for Christ's sake. Now, I have here the Christian who desires to see Muslims come to Christ should, and here are several things that I, I gave you. They should fall deeper in love with Jesus. Seek the God of the Bible through his word. Know God's word. Number two, ask God to bring Muslims to your path and to place his divine constraining love in your heart for them. I encourage you, just continue to do that. Ask God to bring them to your path. Number three, intercede for Muslims always and encourage other Christians to do the same rather than promoting hatred and disdain towards them. You know, you may know people, especially on Facebook, okay? And you may know people on a personal level. I encourage you to share with them and encourage them to pray and intercede for Muslims. Next, pray that God would send laborers into the Muslim world and intercede for those missionaries that are actively laboring among them. Please pray for them. Pray for those missionaries that are in the Muslim world that are here locally and that are abroad. I encourage you to do that. Go online, pray for ministries that are doing that, like Voice of the Martyrs and, and uh, different ministries. Continue to learn about Islam and ministries to Muslims. I encourage you to take the class notes and go over them. You know, we constantly need to be refreshed. Next, seek to befriend Muslims and get to know them. Greet them in public and acknowledge their holidays. If you have any Muslims you know at work or school, invite them out for a meal or coffee or even better, to your home so they can see how a Christian family relates. You know, take those risks of faith. Take those steps of faith. You know, I'll never, I'll never die and say, oh, I wish I didn't invite so many Muslims to my house. But I may regret and say, you know, that one guy or that one lady, I wish I would have invited him over. We may do that. I, I don't want to do that. Or I wish I would have just walked up and just even given him a track. Or just said, salamu alaikum. Okay? So I encourage you. Acknowledge them on Muslim holidays, especially Eid al-Fitr, which is the feast of breaking fast, which we just had, they just had, the celebration of the end of Ramadan, and Eid al-Adha, Eid al-Adha, which is the feast of sacrifice, which occurs about 70 days after Ramadan ends. This is the commemoration of Abraham's offering his son and God providing a ram. Wish them a happy holiday, which is in Arabic, Eid Mubarak, Eid Mubarak. That's all you have to say. Aid Mubarak, and you will see the walls come down, and you are, you're going to make a path, in, you know, that other people won't. I encourage you to seek ways to become all things to all men. For example, in Morocco, it was common on their holidays to bring us baked goods and invite us to share in a meal with them. That's what they would do. Many times when it would be their holiday, they would invite us over to their house. They would bring us big things, and so we also learn to bring them things on our holidays. That's, I would encourage you to do that. If you have any Muslim neighbors or people you know at work or wherever, when it's your holiday, do that. Invite them over for a meal maybe and share with them why you celebrate. I, you know, believe me, it's going to open so many doors. You watch and see. You watch and see. And actually, what we began to do in Morocco, and, um, well, we actually, we did something here, too, because of the, the one Muslim family that we got to know here. We invited them on Christmas to come here to our church, and they came. And they were, they were amazed. But you can do that, where you can begin to invite people on Christmas or Easter and share with them about why you celebrate this holiday. 
Next, be friendly. Take time to say hello. Give a smile and be ready to receive smiles. Men, keep in mind, greet men. Women, greet women. Those of opposite gender can greet if in a mixed group of people with a verbal greeting, not a handshake. So in other words, if I was coming up and I greeted, I saw family like I did at the park on Friday, there was uh, like three men and like two women, I would go over and what you, if you really want to remember this and write this down, you greet from the right hand to the left. So I would come into the room and I would greet him and I would say, salam alaikum, salam alaikum with my shaking my hand. And with a woman, I would just, I would not shake and I would just say, salam alaikum. Okay. And I would continue greeting. So you greet from the right to the left. Uh, let's see here. With familiarity comes the traditional Arab greeting cheek to cheek on both sides for men and women, meaning men with men and women with women. Okay, but, but that's, that's what you do. When, when someone becomes closer to you and you've known them now for some time, you will see them greet you know, on both sides like that. Normally it's four times, one, two, three, four, you know. And the women, some, the women do it a lot. They'll kiss sometimes a lot, a lot of times on one side and then another side. <laughs> Very affectionate. And that's where, you, that's where you get a Middle Eastern culture greet each other with a holy kiss. That's what it was. It was the holy kiss on both sides of the cheeks. Women are more prone to greet with kisses on both cheeks. Okay. Some do's and don'ts in Muslim evangelism. Now, there are so many. Okay, but uh, just, uh, just some things that I thought of that may help you. Number one, speak the truth in love with respect and meekness. You know, once again, you can win the argument but lose the soul, right? But we have to be careful and let's remember to speak the truth but in love. And we need to always just be praying and saying, God, give me that, help me to know what that balance is. Give me that balance because I don't want to minimize the gospel. I don't want to, to water down the gospel, but I don't want to I don't want to get, because you can get angry, you know, when they begin to say things that anger us. And so it's so easy to get offended in our hearts, but we have to know that the gospel will offend. But speaking the truth in love. And secondly, know your Bible. Uh, we, we just simply said we need to know our Bible. We need to study the scriptures and know it. Third, speak with boldness and authority. Stand upon the word of God. Remember that multitudes of saints have spilled their blood in standing for and preserving the Bible. The scripture is precious to us. God gave us the word of God. It is his love letter to us. And think of all the multitudes of saints, as it says in Hebrews 11, 1, since we are surrounded by such a great of cloud of witnesses. They've gone before us, and let's, let's treat this with love and respect. Number four, focus on the major issues, not the minors. And this is such a big thing, you know. And once again, when you're dealing with cults as well, you know, you could easily get off on these minor issues, things that are really, really, really not that important. Major issues, okay? Who is Jesus? What did he do? Who is Muhammad? And how do we know he's a prophet? Is the Quran the word of God? How do you obtain salvation? Why the blood atonement? Okay. And some of those major issues that we talked about, the objections, the Muslims' objections to Christianity. Okay. Number five, commend them for their devotion to Allah and their spirituality, for their sincere desire to seek the truth. You know, that, that many times opens up a conversation to simply commend them and say, you know, I really respect the fact that you, you always think about God and you want to please God. You know, I commend you for that, for your zeal. And, and, and watch what God does to open up a door. Number six, don't laugh at beliefs they express to you, just as you wouldn't want them to laugh at you. And um, I have to admit, there have been times where I've, I've been in conversations, and sometimes it's been normally with a group of people. And they've, they've said something, talking about something in the Bible that we believe. And like some of the, some of the people with them are like, they laugh, you know, at something that we believe in the Bible. And, you know, it, you know, as a human, it, it really, it, 
it hurts. You know, inside you're just like, okay, Lord, just give me your love, God. Because you just, you, you, you burn inside, you know. But you have to just, you have to just ask the Holy Spirit to, to control you. And I've seen this at debates, and I don't like it. I've seen this where there's a, you know, a Muslim apologist and a Christian apologist, and they've given some points, and the Christian will say something about the Islamic doctrine or about Muhammad or something, and you'll hear Christians laugh about it, you know, and I'm just going, you know, that's not a good witness, you know. You know, deal with the things. If something is foolish, you know, let's deal with the facts, you know, but don't laugh, you know. Now, they can laugh. You know, if they laugh, they're not saved. That's the thing, see? If they laugh, so be it. But let it not be me. Um, Number seven, ask them questions about their faith and practices. Muslims will like the fact that you're inquiring and not condemning or criticizing them. You know, I've, I've encouraged you before. Ask them about their beliefs. Ask them, why do you do that? I notice you do this. Ask them questions. Ask them questions. Number eight, don't use a Bible that you have written in when sharing with Muslims, but rather a Bible that is unwritten in. Be aware when handling it. I have an ant crawling on my Bible. (laughs) Be aware when handling the Bible or giving it as a gift to use the right hand. Okay? The right hand is the hand of honor in Islam, and so keep that in mind. When you're handling the Bible... Or when you want to give them a gift, give it with the right hand. When you would be invited to eat with a Muslim family, you always eat with your right hand. You shake with your right hand. They enter in the house or anywhere with their right foot. So these are just some things to keep in mind. And in fact, um, I would encourage you even, when, when I have given a Bible as a gift, that I, I have kissed it. Because they are understanding that you hold the Bible with great respect and it's precious to you. And I have seen Muslim taxis, taxi drivers, take the Bible from me and kiss it too. And then they're then they they are seeing you holding it with respect rather than them respecting it higher than you respect the Bible. Because what a Muslim will do in their house, they take the Quran and they put it on the highest, so the highest point in the in the room, they put it on the highest point. Okay, so just some things to keep in mind. Um, If inviting a Muslim, number nine, to your home for a meal or taking them out to eat, be sensitive to them. Okay, just we have to always be sensitive. Only serve or eat kosher foods, halal, no pork or ham. You know, we just sometimes we can forget about they are a Muslim. Okay, they're not a Christian yet. So I need to be sensitive to where they're at. I'm not going to, you know, impose things on them that they are not. Okay, so let's keep that aware. Be sensitive to that. Number 10, be sincere with them. Sincerity, so important. If you don't know the answer to a question, tell them you will research and find out. Don't just give an answer that you're not sure about, or say something that you're not, you can't back it up, okay? Be sincere. And be sincere about your beliefs. Be sincere about your testimony, about what God has done in your life. Be sincere. Number 11, express your love for the Muslim people and interest in their religion. There was a time that I was in, I was in another state and um, it was Ramadan, and uh, we, were, we, were, we were invited by another church to speak, and we were there for a couple of days, and we were walking on the beach, I'll never forget it, and I saw on this beach there was like nobody, and there was a Muslim family, a man, and I think a woman, and maybe a couple children, and they were all dressed in black. And right away, my heart starts beating, and I'm thinking, you know, we were just walking on the beach, and I'm thinking... There's no way that I can come and walk on the beach and then leave without saying a word to them. So I was just praying, Lord, what do you want me to say? And the Lord just laid on my heart to go over to them, greet them, and just say to them, I want you to know that I'm a Christian 
and that as a Christian, I'm praying for you and I love you. And that was it. That was it. And the man just said, thank you. He, that, that's what he said. He didn't know, know what else to say. So I just, you know what? We need to share our love for them. And God will do what, what he does. He will take those things and, and plant them. But express your love. Tell them that you will pray for them. Okay? There have been times where I have said, I'm going to pray for you. If there ever arises an occasion for you to pray for a Muslim that you know, maybe there's a sickness, maybe there's marital problems, whatever, you know, pray for them. Because I guarantee, guys, you are the only one that will ever say that. You know, someone who's a coworker or at school or a neighbor, they're not, they're not having Muslims saying, oh, I'm going to pray for you. But you are one that says, I'm going to pray for you. And they will open up. Pray for them and perhaps even lay hands on them. Okay, there have been opportunities where God opened the door where this person was sick and I asked them, can I pray for you? And I'm going to lay hands on you because the Bible tells us that we can lay hands on the sick and they will be healed. And, and I have prayed and they've let me pray. Number 12, give God's blessings to them especially if they curse or ridicule you. That sounds funny, <laughs> especially if they curse or ridicule you. But that's exactly what Jesus says. He says, I tell you, bless and do not curse. Do good to them. Treat them with love and kindness. Okay, these are, once again, kind of elementary, but, but we need to hear them. I need to know them. I need to be reminded of them. And number 13, preach the gospel. Be unashamed. Be willing to take risks for God. Lead them to the cross. Rely on the Holy Spirit. You know, <clears throat> I just, we have to be very careful because I have heard so many times of people wanting simply to close a deal. And what do I mean by that? In sharing the gospel and wanting to say, you know, do you want to accept Jesus? And it seems so like, you know, just recently, and I thought, this person had just 10-minute conversation and asked them, do you want to accept Jesus into your heart? And I'm thinking, you know, where is the cross? Where is the repentance? Where is, do they understand their sin? Where is their conviction of their sin? Okay, and we have to be so careful where we want to close the deal so that we can say, hey, you know what, this person I prayed with to receive Jesus. We have to lead them to the cross. Are you leading them to the cross? Are you, do they understand their guiltiness before God? Do they? That person needs to. And we need to rely on the Holy Spirit. Remember, you might be the only genuine Christian that God ever places in a Muslim's path. Now, maybe not. Maybe there are many Christians in their path. But what if? What if you are the only Christian that they ever come across. When that Muslim steps into eternity and stands before the glory of Christ and judgment, what will they say about your witness to them? Will they say, he loved me or she loved me? She showed me the truth in Christ. He cared and went out of his way to demonstrate it. He was just like Jesus. Or will they say he was no different than anyone else? He treated me the same way everyone else treats me. He never told me about Christ. I didn't even know he was a Christian. These are just things that, you know, I, I, I think about them. I really think about them. And I want them to really burn in my heart, you know, and that goes for everyone. You know, I think we, we as Christians need to be a different, we need to be so different than the world. And we need to always just be praying, Lord, who would you have me to share with today? Lord, put me in contact with those people that I would be sensitive to your Holy Spirit. So, this is what I have for you today. Um, any questions or comments, there is my email. Feel free to uh, email me. And uh, any questions you may have also concerning um, women ministering to women, my wife also, uh, uh, we share the same email, so she also can check that. And, you know, any questions I can direct towards my mom if you have any questions. Please keep our family in prayer and the ministry of equipping saints to reach Muslims, as well as open and effective doors to reach the Muslim community around us locally. And I would also ask you to please pray for the ongoing ministry in Morocco. 
in evangelism and church planning. I still, um, God willing, if the Lord allows, I, I, I would still, my desire is to continue to go to Morocco, whether it be once a year or whether it be every two years. Um, you know, the last time I went, it was, it was a great time, especially to be able to sit with the church, the Moroccan believers. Um, I know several of them and be able to, to teach them the word and encourage them. I believe that God is, you know, has kind of that ministry of where Paul, you know, he went back and visited the churches that he had planted to encourage them and to exhort them. And, um, you know, God's given me the language and I want to use it for his glory and pray that God would put, you know, he's already been putting Moroccan Muslims in our path. Um, as I share with you, one family and several other people. Um, so I just pray, I, I want to be used of God, you know, and my prayer, I'm praying constantly for, for all of you that God will, will use you. And, uh, I would love to hear stories. You know, if you have a story or a friend or someone that God is putting in your path, please share that with us.